You're holding tough today, by the way. Until Dawn ain't getting at me. Oh my god! Oh my god. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show whose viewers wouldn't be surprised to see an episode dedicated to Sam's anti-gravity towel. Seriously, she's getting chased by a psychotic killer and it stays up like that? And then she crawls through vents and it stays so clean. This towel is clearly worthy of a theory, but not today. So if you've watched our GT Live live streams, then you know that we recently completed a playthrough of the horror game Until Dawn. No! If you haven't watched our GT Live live streams, then you probably still knew that we recently completed a playthrough of the horror game Until Dawn because YouTube hasn't put a toggle in, allowing subscribers to opt into those notifications. Hey, don't blame the messenger. Regardless, chances are if you watch gamers on YouTube, you've seen this choose-your-own-adventure teen murder simulator hybrid. A game that mashes so many horror movie tropes together, you'd think they'd pulled Keenan Wayans out of retirement and had him do Scary Movie the video game. But here's the thing. While we were all making fun of the gameplay, we are playing a game that encourages you to not move the controller. Compelling gameplay. The really good, but still not really good enough graphics. Didn't quite make it out of the uncanny valley on that one. <laughs> and hammy dialogue. It was just a prank, hand. We all missed something. The point. <laughs> Along with a totem or two, whether it was intentional or not, Until Dawn is more than just a goofy horror movie cliche simulator, and the villain is far more menacing than a gangly spider zombie. It's a much darker, much sadder, and much more serious game than any of us YouTube gamers thought, carrying an incredibly serious message about mental illness and the nature of choice. Now, before I go on, this is a heavy spoiler alert. We're covering everything from the game, so if you haven't watched any of the hundreds of Let's Play and still want to experience it for yourself, turn back now. But if you want to completely change the way you look at the game, well, spend another few minutes with me. We all clear? Good. Now, this game is a blast not only to play, but to discuss. You see, the game not so subtly points out that it's built around the butterfly effect, where decisions you make earlier in the game have significant ramifications down the line. It's a game about choice, and what makes this game endlessly discussable and watchable is seeing how different choices lead to different gruesome murders for our... Jeez, they're 18 and 19 years old? Oh man, now I feel really creepy about trying to get Jess into her underwear. It was just a prank hand. No, no it is not when some of these kids are literally under the age of consent. Oh. Creepy revelations about everyone's true ages aside, make the right choices, nail each QTE, and miraculously, you may be able to keep everyone alive until dawn. Roll credits. Well, not everyone. Meet Josh, older brother of both Beth and Hannah. We see in the game's prologue that one year prior to the events of the game, Beth and Hannah were killed accidentally after a prank went wrong. Yes, you can roll the clip one last time. It was just a prank, Han. Fast forward to the present day, where halfway through the game, you learn that Josh is the psycho, a masked madman setting up elaborately sadistic saw-like traps for his quote-unquote friends to make them pay for the deaths of both his sisters. Well, that and to get them all a few thousand clicks on a certain video sharing platform. God, everyone is a vlogger these days. Now, outside of the supernatural and cannibalistic Wendigos, Josh is the villain of the game, putting his friends through torture. As such, it's only fitting that he's the only playable character who will never survive the night, regardless of your choices. He only has one of two fates, either getting his head crushed by a Wendigo, or if you find enough clues, turning into a Wendigo himself. A fitting end to a crazed maniac. Except... Hold on, Josh's story isn't so cut and dry. True, the torture of his friends is extreme, and he isn't adverse to going so far as to punch Ashley out cold, but none of his actions directly lead to anyone's death. His traps are only there to scare, not kill. Fake bodies, fake bullets, saws that don't go all the way down. Now compare that to Mike, aka the village bicycle where anyone gets a ride, who can kill Emily in cold blood, and the world rejoices. Or how about Ashley? who in some scenarios can choose to kill Chris while he pleads for his life simply by keeping the lodge door locked. Then, in the final scene, Sam can actively choose to blow up the lodge early, killing everyone else in there. And then Matt, who can basically leave his girlfriend Emily for dead when a tower falls. I mean, seriously, the game gives you a lot, a lot of opportunities to kill off Emily. 
In short, pretty much every playable character in this game can take an action that will directly lead to someone else's death, except for Jessica, and except for Josh. But unlike all the other characters, Josh doesn't get a happy ending. And sure, I get it, he tortured his friends, and yeah, that's really bad. But don't let Beth's yoga pants distract you from the truth. What these teenagers did to Hannah was also really bad. These aren't good people. They set up a prank where Mike, Hannah's crush, leads her on to the point that she starts undressing, expecting a little totem action, if you get what I'm saying, all while they film in secret and laugh at her embarrassment. It's ruthless. And unlike the quote-unquote heroes of the story who did this out of sheer meanness, Josh's saw traps aren't just born out of revenge. He has another excuse. Mental illness. Throughout the game, we gradually learn that Josh has had behavioral issues since the age of 11. Since then, he's been treated with various medications for depression. In total, for nine years. And we learn that the mysterious analyst appearing between chapters in the game was actually Josh's psychiatrist helping him to cope with the loss of both his sisters. When we finally get to step inside Josh's eyes at the end of the game, chapter 10, it's clear he's haunted by the vision of his sisters. Why didn't you save us, Josh? Through his hallucinations, we see that he blames himself in large part for their deaths, despite being passed out that night, physically unable to do anything to help them. Now, does all of this excuse his eagerness to strap two people to chairs, force one to choose between his life and the life of his crush, all while spinning saw blades descend from the ceiling? No, but it certainly sheds light onto Josh's motives, showing that he's not a sadistic killer or cruel sociopath. He's a confused and grieving kid. Remember, these kids are like 18 to 20. Still, still kind of creeped out about the Jess thing. And the game actually acknowledges this. Not the creepy Jess thing, just the fact that Josh is in need of help. In alternate dialogue for Josh's big reveal as the psycho, Sam makes it clear that his behavior is more of a cry for help than it was anything malicious. Come on, it was just for fun. Nobody got hurt. You're crying out for help, Josh. In short, Josh is a sympathetic character who needs help. Medical help. Help that, quite frankly, he's not getting. And this is where we go from Josh being in a weird gray area, a character who did some awful things but had some excuses for it, to someone who is outright innocent. Throughout the game, we can piece together Josh's illness by the symptoms he demonstrates. Chapter 10 shows us that he clearly has very vivid visual hallucinations. He also has auditory hallucinations, hearing both his sister's voices in his head as well as the psychos. It's important to note here, though, that the mask-wearing psycho isn't a separate personality, which would change his diagnosis. How do we know? Well, if Sam escapes being chased by Josh, he can find a tape where he's practicing his psycho talk. Hello? Hello, children? That's not right. I mean, every good masked killer needs a catchphrase, right? The psycho is just a character he puts on for the purposes of this theatrical event he had planned, not a split personality. So we have visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, but Josh is also delusional. The delusion that this is all a fun prank or game, that this would actually be socially acceptable to his friends. He also has delusions of grandeur. Seriously, in his opening video, Hello? Friends and fans. Hello, friends and fans? Who is he talking to, anyway? Seriously, his channel has, like, what? Seven subscribers. And after the events of the game, he's gonna lose all of them. YouTuber tortured me and gave me PTSD. Unsub. I'd say that that's a fairly solid reason to unsubscribe from a channel. He's also operating under the delusion that his friends don't care about him, feeling so persecuted that he physically saws himself in half simply to prove how little they care, when that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Finally, we see his speech deteriorate into incoherent rambling. Based on these symptoms, Josh appears to have schizophrenia, a brain disorder in which a person has trouble distinguishing reality from fantasy, and has trouble managing managing normal emotions. Symptoms include everything we just mentioned, visual and auditory hallucinations, delusions, social withdrawal, disorganized speech, and the condition tends to appear between the ages of 16 and 30. See, that age joke at the beginning wasn't just a non sequitur, it actually had a purpose. All in all, it sounds pretty cut and dry, right? But then we look at his medical records. The slate of doctors listed for treating him over the last nine years, Dr. Hill included, are all MDs, meaning that they're psychiatrists, people who went to medical 
medical school, had a year of medical internships, and have three years of residency to assess and treat mental health conditions. Training which now enables them to prescribe medicine to their patients. So Josh seems like he's seeing the right people for his issues, except apparently he's not. Looking down the list of medicines and treatments he's been given, they're all for extreme depression. You see, nerve cells in the brain communicate to each other using chemicals called neurotransmitters. I've mentioned them before in my video on the addictive qualities of mobile gaming, and as you can imagine, there are a bunch. But the most famous are dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Well, depression and schizophrenia are currently thought to be primarily tied to different neurotransmitters, with schizophrenia being linked to the overactivity of dopamine, while depression is thought to be tied to a decrease in the production of serotonin. The drugs we see Josh being prescribed, though, are all focused around serotonin. Fluoxetine is an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which, to grossly simplify, is meant to increase the amount of serotonin in the brain. Duloxetine is a selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which again leaves dopamine, Josh's actual issue, untreated. And both amitriptyline and phenylzine are some of the earliest antidepressants developed. Effective, yes, but now replaced with newer, less side effect heavy drugs. And neither of them primarily focused on what Josh's true problem is, regulating the amount of dopamine in his brain. Knowing this, the results of Josh's medical report are unsurprising. Each time, the medicine didn't fix his problem, and occasionally he would resort to taking more in an attempt to see any sort of result, any sort of relief. And here's why. He was being treated for the wrong disorder. His primary issue is schizophrenia, not depression. Of course the medicines would have limited effectiveness. They weren't doing anything to treat the primary symptoms of hallucination, delusion, paranoia, and disorganized speech. What does this mean? It means that Josh wasn't getting the help that he needed to mitigate his condition, and leads us to the true meaning of Until Dawn. In a game that prides itself on choice for its characters, Josh had no choice. Schizophrenia is tied very closely to genetics, so he had no choice to get the disorder in the first place. Josh had no choice when placed in the hands of experts who misjudged and mistreated his condition. He was passed out and had no choice when the rest of the group pulled a prank that would ultimately kill his two younger sisters. And even in death, he has no choice. You as the player cannot save him, no matter what you do. There is no happy ending for Josh. He was doomed from the start. In a game all about choice, probably the biggest one that you can have is forgiving Josh, looking beyond his actions, the awful things that he did, and choosing to save his life, recognizing him for the young man in need of help that he is. But you can't do that. When you look at it this way, Until Dawn is a big metaphor, where the true monster is psychological disorder. It strikes randomly, has no mercy, and gives you no chance of escape no chance to run and hide. And the true villain of the game is Dr. Hill, and the system that didn't know enough, or simply didn't care enough, to give Josh the help that he so desperately needed. Now that is truly a horror game. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament! Today we covered a game full of sexy characters and important choices, so in honor of that, today's poll has one important question for you. Hot or not, the Windigo. Bangable undead or a face only a mother could love? Click on one to choose or click the links in the description to cast your vote, then find out next week whether you guys would swipe right or swipe left. Bow chicka bow wow! And hey, if you want to check out some hilarious highlights of our playthrough from Until Dawn, click here to check out the GT Live channel for moments like this. Spoopiness to the max. And that's about it for today, so if you'll excuse me, I've got some strategizing to do in real time.